football. I'm going to say this to you. Here were the top dudes during my time. Um, Jerome, Michael Carter at SMU was also a super football player back in the day. I'm trying to remember. Jerry Ball also was a pretty good ball player. He was also at SMU. Um, and of course, Tony Casillas. I mean, I, 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 I post something every now and then on my Twitter page. <laughs> after, after I signed my scholarship to go to OU, I was like, oh, you know, they got Casillas there. And I'm like, eh, you know, I might, they got two DTs over in Miami <laughs> and I can play next to Jerome. They, they play a 34 in uh, OU. He goes like, yeah. And I go, Casillas is there. Eh, I don't know. He just won out with a trophy. I think I'm going over to UM. Here's Tony Casillas. He joins us now. <laughs> there was only one of you, man. I'm like, eh, you know, I'm going to go to a place where they got two of those guys. <laughs> well, I think you upgraded a little bit, Dan. You went to you went to Miami. You got to play alongside the great John Brown and yourself. You're you're a humble guy, but you was a baller in your own right. So, uh, but it's it's a great time. It's always time to reflect and just kind of look back and. You know, now the, the kind of the state of college football where it is, the NIL and transfer portal. Hell, if you wouldn't have liked it there when I was there, you know, in modern day fo college football, hell, you could have just left. <laughs> can but, you uh, imagine, hey, Tony? It's always great to be on here, you my friend. Can you imagine, Tony, those teams with your team, with the Boz on that, my team with Irvin, with NIL, if we had that during our time. Even Dion up at FSU was during our time. Can you imagine what college football would have been like? I mean, with all those personalities, and because social media wasn't around, you could those when you showed up in a when OU showed up in a place, like when they came down to the Orange Bowl, you had gone to the Falcons the year previous. Um, when they showed up, eighty six thousand people were down at the Miami Orange Bowl for that game down there. I mean, because they were such events, I think social media kind of takes that away a little bit. But, boy, can you imagine if we had that during our time? I, I'd have a pizzeria on every block in Miami. <laughs> well, I, I know this. I probably would have tried to play college football for at least 10 years like some of these guys are now. I mean, why go to the NFL the way it's uh, these guys are getting paid? And, you know, I think in our era it was certainly different. Um, you mentioned Brian Bosworth. I mean, he was creative in his own right, developing this persona. Uh, you know, the University of, of Miami, the, 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 the U, I mean, you, you look at uh, what the personalities you had and you know, you know, my, uh, Michael Irvin and, 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 you know, some of the, the guys that would have been obviously in social media today. I think it's always funny. I asked different guys. I, I believe I had Troy. I was doing my podcast and I asked him, I said, what do you what do you think would be different about modern day football? Uh, and it's specifically talking about the NFL and he goes, well, I'd probably have about 5 million more followers on Instagram, but you know, that equates to money. And, 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 you know, the, the creativity that a lot of guys did, they had their own little swagger. They did their, you know, they didn't really need to, you know, the, things blew up in the media. The mainstream media back then was like a microphone in your face and, you know, my like EP wire and everything, but now everything's instant. As soon as you, you, you do a, you know, you, you, post something on social media your your podcast goes goes on on uh, out there in the public so as you mentioned it's instant you know there's no there's no speculation don't you think don't you uh, i think that's really another thing that's not that i kind of miss is a speculation because there's not much speculation in today's world especially in sports because everyone wants to be the first one whether it's the the player whether whoever's posting it they want to be the first one to get it out there in the in space do you agree, Tone, that here's the one thing that I'm going to go on the other end before we get into the Cowboys here a little bit. Um, don't you agree the one thing that the nil does, and maybe this is just more for the high-end players or the players that are going to be drafted. You know the one thing that I think it gives you an advantage of? Handling money. You know, when you get into the NFL, Tony, and you sign a signing bonus, you were the number two player taken, and, you know, all of a sudden – you know, you're 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 selling your books back to have money to go to a student union, or you're doing something for you to make some money. And before you know it, you got a couple hundred thousand dollars in your in your checking account, 
And most guys aren't prepared for that. Don't you think some of this gives some of these kids an ability to maybe work that and make mistakes early before you get the big NFL money? And you're a little more prepared maybe to handle that. Well, I hope so. I hope I hope they're getting an education on how to handle money because, as you mentioned, Dan, you know, you're coming from a place, obviously, growing up and not having a whole lot of money. And then, obviously, you get a go to the NFL or whatever sport, you get a sinus bonus. And, and now it's like a lot of – there's a lot of different problems that start to exist. And we all know there's people that come out of the, the woodwork and want to be your friend and want got something for you. You know, at least these kids – can put everything in perspective. I mean, I, I do think there is some good things about the NIL. I think that you kind of hit on, you know, guys that aren't going to get drafted or not going to, are not going to get high and get a chance to play in NFL. Hey, make the money in college, put some of that money away and, and prepare, and give yourself a head start because, you know, I have a son that's uh, in the workforce now. I graduated and a daughter that graduated last year from college and you know, going out of college and making six figures, it's difficult in the, in the workplace now. As an athlete, you definitely get a head start, but, you know, it, it doesn't last forever. I mean, you know, you you know, everyone knows it's had money and you go through the ups and downs of how the management and people want this and want that. You know, hopefully there is something in place that really gets these guys prepared where you don't have all these scavengers coming out of the woodworks and, you know, and agents and everything else like that. And I hope it's, yeah, that's the thing that, that's kind of scary. And I, I think it's really there's not a lot of answers to this, a lot of the questions is, you know, how's this stuff regulated? Yeah. I mean, is there programs in place? Is there something in-house? Or, you know, do they have their own financial guide? There's mom and dad, you know. And, and that's another thing. There's a lot of – it's 17. Uh, it's hard. You're a teenage. I mean, you're 17, 18 years old and going into college and how are you having these problems? And – when I was 21, I was young. I didn't, I was young at 21. And now to have to deal with that stuff at 17 and 18 and be able to make the right decisions, I can only hope, uh, partner, that there is something in place that helps educate these kids. Absolutely. Um, Tony, a guy who was a pro bowler and played um, inside tackle, uh, just your thoughts on Aaron Donald calling it a career and what, mm -hmm. you know, he brought to the table 10 years, um, eight first team all pros. 10 Pro Bowls, three-time Defensive Player of the Year, over 100 sacks, two NFC titles, a Super Bowl championship. Really compact a lot of stuff inside of a 10-year career. I mean, the guy's a dog. I, you know, it's it's Reggie White, Minister of Defense, and I think Aaron Donald. I think there's a lot of a lot of defensive players, and and you look at Lawrence Taylor. Lawrence Taylor is more of a hybrid, but as far as defensive linemen with their hand on the ground, I mean, Aaron Donald just made it look so effortless. Uh, you know, I just remember going in there and watching watching film on Reggie White, and I'm like, you're probably the same thing. You're like, and you yeah. know, and around him, it's like, oh my god, this guy is the hump. He's a freak. Hey, the yeah. hump. How did, did, how many, hey, hey, Tony, how many times did you try to hump and go? How oh, does he do that? Hell no. I mean, it's it's just you know, there's so many. There's a, there's few guys that can that have that ability, the strength, the quickness, and just make themselves small and a. Uh, in a in, in a very small you know very very small space when it comes to inside and the way he's able to work and just his strength and you know not a big guy in his height but I mean the dude was a monster and I, I'm gonna miss watching him play I mean I, I yeah I'm probably like you as a defensive player or anyone I mean there's not too many defensive linemen that can capture your your attention like he did and to see him uh, you know hanging up ten years I mean that's a long career but. Uh, I think uh, when I, when I think everything is all said and done, it's Reggie White and it's Aaron Donald, and I'm not sure Aaron Donald's not in the same atmosphere as is uh, stratosphere as as Reggie White because Reggie White was an amazing player. So, I mean, it's just uh, phenomenal the career that guy had, it, just a tremendous, tremendous player. Absolutely. Um, you know, I just thought about something because we're based in Philly and I want to get your take on Jalen Hurts. Um, are you surprised, Tony, of his ascent, where he is now and where he was in Norman when he transferred there? Because when he came out, there was always questions on reading defense. He's still progressing as a young player. And I think 
Riley did a decent job with him there. Plus he had CD lamb there, but mm -hmm. are you surprised that hurts is where he's at right now? Well, I, I think the way he just kind of climbed the ladder pretty quickly and just, he, he seems to me in that, that position that you have to have this football aptitude and be able to make decisions. And it seems like that they put him in a great position to make those plays and, and I don't think it's systematic. I think there was so much a timing on that offense. And I think whatever happened, I, I, I'm just like just like the, the Eagles nation and yourself, you cover the Eagles. I know I follow you and, and you got great content about it, but you're just scratching your head and like, what the hell happened yeah. in the last six games or games, whatever games of the season where they just, it, it was a spiral out of control. And then Jalen, you know, I, I think that, you know, and he, I think, hey, hey, Tony, and he imploded with him. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm, well, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not leaving him out. I'm just saying that the quarterback it has to deflect a lot of criticism, and certainly he was the, one of the reasons why they weren't as good. Um, but I will – there was times when guys would drop balls and, you know, guys quitting on routes. And when things aren't going well, then I think that that really kind of shows the – character of your team when yeah everything's great dan you know that when you're you're balling you're winning going to nfc championship and you're getting a big contract everything's fine but as soon as you hit some criticism and some negativity i mean all of a sudden it starts imploding and, and i don't know he just didn't seem comfortable I, I don't think that that he didn't look like obviously the year before and i guess i'm surprised on how you know where he started oklahoma as a number you know as a, a draft in the first round and then how he just went up, up the ladder. And then all of a sudden he just went down after, you know, from the, the, the previous year playing in the Super Bowl. And I don't know, is it coaching or is it playmaking ability? Is it, is it his ability to, to make decisions? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of different things, but man, that team right there, I mean, as a Cowboys fan and some of the Cowboys nation, I mean, they got their own problems, but to see that happen like that, it's just what the hell's going on. And I don't think anyone could really figure it out. No, I, it, and, and that's the problem that I'm having so far because I don't really think they've really addressed anything on the defensive side of the football. We'll get to that here in a minute. But, you know, I, I before I want, one, one more thing before I get to the Cowboys um, and get your thoughts on them. Does it, does it ever reflect to you during this time of the year how insane it is, Tony, that you were the number two pick in a draft, a defensive nose guard tackle? That and by the way, spectacular college career and a heck and a really great NFL career. But for you, we are you shocked? Is it luck? We, did you know you were going that high? It, 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 when the phone call came from the Falcons, were you shocked? Surprised? Were you glad? I me, mean, I'd like to know because not very many defensive tackles slash. Nose tackles can pick number two overall. <laughs> yeah, that's nose tackles kind of a dying breed, but you know, still there's some teams that run a three four. But you know, it's pretty surreal when I look back and you know, I, I'm transitioning. You know, we were moving and I haven't moved uh, in 27 years, and it's amazing all the pictures and memorabilia and things that you have. And and you're probably the same way. Anyone that's played Tony, I got stuff in my drawer. Oh, I, I, that, I love you know your what? stuff. Get man. This. I, got, I got I, I got I've stuff seen in some my of your drawer. Stuff. And I found this thing here. This is the first Jimmy Johnson letter for the first wow. training camp that he had that Jerry Jones and them owned when we were going to Thousand Oaks. And I'm like, you know, and he's talking about moving. And I'm like, I got things <laughs> everywhere like you do. And we're, I go like this. Holy cow. I throw more stuff away than people would want. Yeah, I know. I'm the same way. You know, I, I almost feel like a, a, a memorabilia hoarder. All this right. stuff that you... You know, stuff in your attic you haven't seen in forever. The point being is, like, all of a sudden you start looking at some of these things that you've had in your life and are blessed to have. And and uh, I think it's kind of the surreal part of being an athlete is, like, you really don't know. You you you, you dream when you're young, um, but you don't understand. You know, there's a certain period of time in your life and you realize some people are like, oh, this isn't for me. Uh, and then there's people, like, they're lucky enough to have these aspirations to keep on dreaming and like, okay, this, this is some reality, but you know, I really didn't, even when I got the, uh, yeah, I really thought that I try to make myself, 
understand how lucky I was and am, you know, having a great family and hum be stay humble. I think that's the best thing you can do. But, you know, I really didn't think about it. I just thought, well, you know, there's a plan, you know, if the plan is for me to go and play college football, then that's the plan. I'll just keep working in the NFL. I'll just keep working. And, you know, you know, hopefully good things are happening. Make some good decisions, work your ass off and, you know, let's see what happens. And, you know, for me, that's kind of the way I, that's kind of the way I led my life, man. It's like, I work my ass off and I'm like, okay, I'm not the, you know, you, you have to go with what you have and develop what you have and your weaknesses and strengths. And, you know, when I, when I really got the, I got the call and that I was going to be drafted to, you know, the second player to pick draft, I was like, okay, this is for real. Uh, it was pretty surreal, but, um, but it was an accomplishment. And I think, I think that, you know, not everyone's going to be a hall of famer, you know, a pro bowler. I mean, if you have a nice career and you're able to, you know, maybe an impact and develop relationships, cause that's what it's about. Right. Yep. You know, along the way and just in, in ball and have, you know, and, 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 and just forge relationships and all that. That's the most important thing. And I, I think that for me, that's what I was able to, to accomplish, you know, as I, as I mentioned, all the stuff that you have in your attic and you're going through all this. Where's the Lombardi <laughs> trophy? Uh, it's in a it's in a box right now. I have not gotten it out hey, yet. Hey, Dave Remington, I asked him where his two Lombardis are and his Outland trophies, and he goes, "I think they're in a garage somewhere." And I'm going well, like, "Man, oh, well, mine's not in a garage. I'm doing a box right now because I because oh, okay. I, uh, I haven't unpacked them. But the point being is that I guess that's kind of a metaphor, or just not a metaphor, but that's kind of like okay, well, it happened a lifetime ago, but it's still part of your DNA and what you were able to accomplish. And, you know, I, I don't think that you live in the past, but it's kind of nice to reflect and yeah. look and have those memories of playing, you know, teammates or guys like yourself. I mean, cause that's what it's about, right? At the end of the day, you can't take all that stuff away. You can't take those relationships away that you have with your, your guys in the locker room. And Tony, you know, I, I think this give... stuff reminds us of yeah. the best times outside of our families Mm -hmm. that we had with a different type of family. And I think that's what that stuff and why it's so hard to get rid of that stuff or we accumulate so much of it is because there's so many memories where, like you said, just something of a road trip, a, a practice, <laughs> being next to Ed Jones, Ed Jones looking over at me going, I want to do that thing that Cilio does. And I went, I looked over <laughs> at Butch Davis and went, what did he say? Butch goes, I heard it too. And I'm going like, <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, what I mean, were you right? doing, Dan? Yeah, right? <laughs> anyway, yeah. hey, I'm going to say this about the current Cowboys. Mozzie Smith's got to pick it up, man. And I mean, pick them feet up. Let's go. We got we to move them feet a little more here. I thought he got a little behind there. And right now, if I were to say the problem with the Cowboys are two-point, they're not very physical at the, at the point of attack when it comes to stopping the run. And I don't think they're very physical at the point of attack of running the ball. And if you don't have that against the 49ers or maybe even against the Eagles, I don't think you're getting out of the NFC. And they really haven't addressed anything so far, Tony. How do you look at it? I don't know. I, I, I you know, before I was, I was going to come on here with you, I was thinking about the state of the Cowboys, and that's kind of the million dollar question. I don't think anyone can figure it out, but it's almost like are they, are they going to transition into rebuilding? Because I saw. You know, they lost four of their defensive linemen, which were, you know, you Nevin Gallimore, Jonathan Hankins, Thorne Starmstrong, uh, Dante Fowler. All four of those guys are gone. And, you know, what are you going to do to replace the depth? I mean, you know, those guys are nice players, but they're going somewhere else to play. You know, a couple of them are going to join Dan Quinn and Washington. And, and now the, the Mozzie Smith, I don't know what it is about Michigan, but, you know, talk with Charlton, they didn't work out for him. And now Mozzie Smith, where there was so much hype and expectation, this guy was going to be the guy to come in and really play the physical, you know, had this statue as a player, was going to be a hell of a run stopper. And oh, by the way, could get a good push in the pocket and the pass rush, but kind of vaporized. Yeah. And I, I asked, I asked guys in the organization, I said, well, what's up with Mozzie? He goes, he's just not ready yet. And I'm like, he's not ready. I mean, he's, you know, he's a, a he's a first round draft pick. I mean, these guys got to make an impact. And 
And I don't know. I think that that's the question. You know, they weren't physical at linebacker. I mean, that was really what got them, you know, in, in the playoffs is that, you know, Green Bay just just kept – I mean, they, they were they were too predictable. And they just picked and picked. And, you know, physically at the defensive line, those guys didn't – I mean, they didn't get get anything done, and and so I think that that's to me it's a question: Are they ready? To, are they rebuilding? I mean, because it sure seems to me, I think the Cowboys' best chance is pass them by. I mean, honestly, I mean, I I, I don't. And when you look at their their capability, I mean, they I think they were more capable capable last year than they have been in a long time, and they didn't get it done, and now they're dismantled. A lot of these players are gone, so. You know, Mozzie Smith is just a, it's a head scratcher because I really thought like yourself, this guy was going to come, come in and just be, be a difference maker. And we haven't really seen a whole lot uh, this far. Do you believe Dak Prescott will deliver a Super Bowl for the Dallas Cowboys? Oh my gosh. I don't know. I, 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 I you know, yeah, the, you do the, Tony. I mean, I, 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 I don't think that he's got the, I think now with the way the, the salary of these guys are being paid, it's just a norm. A guy's, you know, some guy that's uh, going to th- sign a three-year deal is going to make $40 million a year, twenty, you know, $30 million. And so that's expected. You know, you look at Kirk Cousins has won one playoff game. It's made over $4 million, $400 million. But when it comes to the Cowboys, I just – his decision-making – you know, Dan, you know this. You've seen a lot, lot – uh, enough – football in your life and you understand the game in a, in that small moment where you got to make a decision and pull the trigger there's no hesitation it's gone you make decision and and if even if it's quarterback and I didn't obviously didn't play quarterback we've been around the game and watched it if you have a hesitation that's the difference and I think that that's the problem with Dak he hesitates he looks for the easy you know, the easy uh, completion, uh, he progressive, but he wants he wants to go to the the most, uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, less stress situation. And and when if that's not if that's not there, then he makes a decision. And it's an, it's the impulsive decision is not the right decision to make. And, you know, I think for me, that's the that's the problem with Dak. Is it all Dak's fault? Um. I mean, I, I would say 80% of it, but I think also 20, a lot of it has to do with coaching too. I think in that last game when they, they got their, you know, got blown out at home by green Bay, I'm thinking, what is, what is this? I mean, you know, here's the thing about the, the Cowboys is that it's like anything in life. You, if you inherited something, you know, you better earn it. Because if you don't earn it, you're not going to inherit it. If that makes sense. And once these guys inherit, I mean, you got to go out and earn what, people did before you you know the star or whatever that represents and i think sometimes these guys don't understand that because of the brand and everything that goes along and it's very they're very polarized and and i'll tell you what you know you know this that people are gonna get ready to play the cowboys man they may they may lose the 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 you know four straight after they after the game if they end up upsetting or beating the Cowboys, but they're gonna be ready and that's the problem with them you know it just seems to me that dak there's this law that comes with big games and big moments and for some reason just can't make that right impulsive decision two last questions for you and you know tony i think it tell me if you think i'm off base with this here you played for jimmy i played for jimmy i don't think that they fear jerry jones like they feared jimmy and what i mean by that is that had nothing to do with the logo it had nothing to do with the brand. You, if you play poorly, and I'm going to make them laugh here, folks. If you played poorly against Washington, you didn't get fed on the airplane coming back. <laughs> if you didn't play well against Washington, there is no dinner. And I think that since he's left that building, that that has been the one dynamic that, hey, it's okay that I'm a superstar cowboy, but you don't play like a champion. Yeah. You know, here's the thing also is I think maybe it's difficult because, you know, I, I don't know the the command that uh, the head coach has, but there's got to be a way in which, you know, Jimmy was the best at this. 
he knew what the bottom line was going to be, but he knew what he was was doing. He had a plan, right? Yeah. And you know that story about not getting fed on the way home from the trip. That's a true story, man. I I lived it. You lived it. Everyone that played for Jimmy Johnson knows it. And that is not. That is no fabrication. What's that was? Hey, 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 we're gonna have we're gonna have dinner. No, we're not. No, no, they're not. No, no that's okay. <laughs> hey, okay, but what? So, Coach Wanstead said, Jimmy, they, you know, they once said they lost the game. They need to eat because now they didn't. They need to learn, <laughs> and that's what he did. But he, here's the thing, also, Dan. It's like, is there the most the brilliant minds as coaching is how do you? How do you make these guys feel insecure about their jobs? Because right. I don't think there's a lot of guys that really are because there's so much money that and maybe at the Cowboys organization is how do you make them insecure that they're going to lose their job? Now, maybe these maybe there is, but it doesn't it doesn't I'm not getting any indication that there there is any fear of losing your, your job and having to go out on the street the next the next week. Um, Jimmy made you fear you're losing your job because that was real i mean obviously it's a different era but there's got to be a way in which you motivate these guys which it means something where the head coach is just not trying to you know coach out a contract because he needs a contract i mean and, and the dynamic is definitely different in dallas it's unlike any other place in the nfl and that's the problem with this organization if, if you're going to criticize it starts with the the management because because jerry since Jimmy left is the one that's making the decisions and that's who players are answering to, and they're not answering to the coach. And to me, I want to answer to my coach because you know, it's all about pleasing him and making him feel in, and, and, and really the accountability and, 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 and really the success is, is made and, and the credit is to your coaches and the players and that dynamic. I want to get credit to him. I, I think that that's that's how we should be taught. You know, you, you learn, you know, you learn that as a when you start in sports, it's like the coach, you know, have respect for the coach, respect the coach respects you. And as you get on the, the NFL level, it's like I don't want to let anybody down. And I don't think there's any of that. Certainly, it seems like with the Cowboys organization and and quite frankly, maybe the NFL, maybe it's accountability with the with the players, you know, there's got to be a voice in in the locker room. There's got to be accountability. If you're, you know, I know when we played, when I played in Dallas, Troy was the guy. I mean, he was the, you know, the stoic in a good way leader. It's like you knew that, hey, I better be ready to play because not only do I get an answer to Jimmy, I can answer my my franchise quarterback because who that that's the guy I want to go out there and play for. Finally, I'm gonna ask. May I ask you a tough question? Sure. Who'd you enjoy playing for more, Switzer or Jimmy? That's a great question. Um, I, you know what, I, 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 I think they both shaped me the way I am now. I will say this: that the Jimmy Johnson saved my football life, and I owe him a lot for that. Uh, because when I was in Atlanta, you know, I was in the brinks of just saying I'm done with this, um, and I was able to, you know, I encourage those guys to come and save me and and, and trade for me. And they did, but. The same thing was Coach Switzer. I mean, there was a time in my life, a freshman in college, I think everyone goes through it. You're ready to quit. And, Absolutely. You know, I was ready to go go back home. And, you know, I don't know what I would have done if, if Coach Switzer wouldn't have brought me back to campus and said, hey, I want you to come here and help me win the national championship. So, you know, that's a great question. I was very fortunate to have those two guys. I mean, I, I you know, when you talk about – By the about, way, I love both of them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, think about it. You know, you've met Coach Switzer. I mean, you know, he's a great he's a man's man. Absolutely. I mean, he he is a unique person. Both of them are. Uh, but I, I think that Coach Switzer uh, is 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 like my second father. He has a lot of, uh, you know, ki- a lot of uh, players like myself will, will say the same thing. Thousands of them. And um, but man, both Here, I'll make guys, it easy man. on you. Why don't we just say Larry Lacewell's our favorite? And I th- we'll end it there. <laughs> Maybe you're. He was always like the, he was the mediator between the two, so oh, he was man. always the guy in the middle, right? Yeah, and you know, and, and here's the thing: I'm just so glad that the whole deal with oh yeah, you, know, you talk about Jimmy and Jerry, all that 
you know, drama and speculation. Why, you know, he didn't get to ring. I'm glad that's over. But, you know, I, I think both of those guys, and you know this, Dan, with Jimmy, uh, Coach Johnson, and certainly with, with Coach Switzer, is that I could call him up and, you know, he'd be Anytime. there. And, uh, you want to hear something crazy, Tony? Yeah, absolutely. I, I was texting the other night with Coach Switzer. Yeah. It must have been 9 o'clock um, his time. And we're going back and forth. And he's like, I'm 80, 90 or 80-something years old right now, man. I'm <laughs> having a great time in my life. And, and we're, he's, he, you know, he was such a fire plug, man. And I remember walking in because, really, I mean, they had given – I have my scholarship. I posted it to go to OU and I'm like, you know, then Jimmy and Butch and Dave and those guys were like, my folks wanted me to stay on the East coast. We had some sick family members and coach Switzer yeah. goes, look, family is always more important. Don't worry about it. Good luck to you. And when I played against him, he would always make it a, it a, it a deal to come <laughs> across and go, I should never have done it, kid. I should never <laughs> have done it. And I was and we 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 have we became really good friends. And coach Coach Johnson goes, man. I go, oh no! If I wasn't going to play for any, I was going to play for him because I would. I was not going to play for anybody else, other than uh, Jimmy Johnson or Coach Switzer. Yeah, I know. And then Coach Switzer. I mean, think about that. He's such an unselfish, uh, you know, guy that uh, I think that you know back then, especially recruiting. I mean, he was Coach Johnson. Obviously, was a, a tremendous recruiter, but Coach Switzer was a was the guy. I mean, it, it, he could sell ice and Eskimo. I don't know if I should say that. I mean, in this culture, but my point being is this, this guy was a tremendous recruiter and being oh, yeah. able to tell you that, be honest with you and say, Hey kid, you know, I get it. You know, just take it easy on us when we play you. Okay. Um, but show I mean, up just, in a big fur coat and you're sitting there going, oh, who is that guy on the sideline, you know, with the hat, smoking a cigarette. Yeah. And yeah, he just had style, man. Charisma. I love him. Very charismatic. Both those guys. Absolutely. Tony. It is always great to catch up with you, my friend. Good luck on the move. Hey, by the way, worst thing on the planet I've ever done is move. I, I Training camp, mini camp, uh, three days, I'll take those things over a move <laughs> any day. Man, I'll tell you what, I'd move, I'd move like uh, several times before I'd want to go to training camp. So, hey, man, I'll stick to moving, buddy. But, hey, I appreciate it. It's always great to catch up with you, man. You did an amazing job. I love your opinions. I love it because you're you're real, man. And that's in this world. Uh, and you're you're valid, man, to points, man. And so uh love you, brother. I love you too, Tony. I mean it, you know, the respect that I have for you and it is immense. And you know that for your accomplishments and who you are and what you've become as a dad too, and a family man. I mean, you're very balanced and it's uh somebody to look up to. And I always have. Thank you, Tony. I appreciate it. Thank you, brother. Be careful. You, you got down. it. That is our good friend, Tony Casillas. Make sure you hit the like button. Hit that like button. We appreciate him coming aboard. But also, don't forget, we got, hey, we haven't got to all our topics yet. All right? March Madness. It's here. It's going on right now. I'm actually watching Carolina and Wagner. And if you want to make it even more interesting for yourself, Jacob Sports is looking. For a select 500 folks of our loyal viewers and subscribers, please do me a favor. Underdog Fantasy and Jacob are teaming up. You only thing you have to do is when you sign up, 10 bucks. Then they match it, 10 bucks, 20 bucks. They match it, 20 bucks all the way up to 100. Very simple, okay? It's one of the best events of the year. Next to the Super Bowl, the most bet on event, and really maybe even funner than the Super Bowl. So, you have to remember also, there's a promo code, WIN, W-I-N, that's W-I-N. We'll reset, put a new topic out, hit it right here on the National Football Show.